this week on To the Contrary. First, women take charge at the world's largest interfaith gathering. Then, Jennifer Lawrence on equal pay in Hollywood. Behind the headlines, how overparenting can shortchange your child. Bonnie Irve, welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. Up first, women and religion. Religious women are taking charge to achieve gender equality at the first women's assembly at the Parliament of the World's Religions in Salt Lake City. Faith leaders from 50 religions across 80 countries are in attendance. Leaders from atheist organizations are present as well. Women from 19 of those faiths are speaking at the event, addressing issues such as sexual violence, equal rights, and discrimination. Women have always been treated abysmally. It's the tragedy of, uh, of human civilization, um, and religions have contributed to it. It's time for us to be treated with full equality, with the, the dignity that is at the heart of all religions. They are also calling upon their own religious leaders to ensure that they treat women as equals. The meeting is the largest interfaith event in the world. It's the sixth of its kind since being revived in 1993. That 100 years after the first parliament convened. But it is the first to give women a central role. But it's not a question of being at the top, right? It's a question of being at the table uh, where we have not been allowed. Institutions still keep the doors closed to women's participation, not only in leadership, but in fundamental decision making. So, Congresswoman Norton, what will this event mean for women, religious women? Bonnie, I can only hope that these women who represent the majority of adherents to most religions uh, ask the question, why women are almost always barred from leadership of those same religions. Long overdue. I mean, we have left the religious space to patriarchy for too long and paid a really heavy price. So I'm glad to see religious women stepping forward in a religious framework, not just in a secular framework. Well, we know that when women band together across differences, extraordinary things can happen, but there aren't enough men there. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I, I think that, that it's always good to sort of have a you know, step back and check where you are on issues like equal rights and, and, and uh, feminism. I also think we want to be careful not to confuse or to conflate gendered traditions or gendered differences with real abuses um, and atrocities against women. Such as? Well, I think about my own faith. I'm, I'm Jewish, and I think about lots of things that we do with my daughters versus what you do with your sons. Some of these are wonderful traditions, and I think we have to be careful to sort of accept what are reasonable gender differences in religion, and then recognize that, wow, there are really horrible things happening to women around the globe um, in the name of faith, and we want to make sure that we sort of recognize those for as serious as they really are. Okay, but, uh, uh, but uh, we know that there are terrible things going on around the world, but let's focus on women in churches. It's always been amazing to me. Women are the backbone of any church, synagogue, synagogue, temple, uh, you know, whatever um, in the world. And very few faiths, and I think of some actually conservative faiths like Southern Baptists have female preachers, but most Catholicism, uh, only Reformed Judaism, not in Islam, can women be church leaders. Why have women always put up with this? I don't get it. I don't think women have put up with it. I think it's the challenges that we haven't had our voices heard and we haven't been able to really come together. And part of it is because they are a religion of faith. Um, so a lot of people are, find it challenging to really challenge faith, but you're seeing a more and more strong movement. Um, I would say within the context of Islam, the history really started off strong on women and we lost it. And so now there's a movement for a revival to go back to the strong point, which we started off with, which was women in leadership. How big is that revival? That's fascinating. I think that it's still small. I mean, you're seeing it across across the world from Malaysia to Egypt, here in the U.S. with the first women-only mosque in California. You're really seeing a push, but it's still not um, that kind of tipping point where it'll really lead to change. But, but well, what really bothers me is that sexism in religions is more deeply embedded than in other institutions. You know, you can finally get to be a corporate executive. You can yeah. finally get to be a member of Congress. 
women are barred from leadership. Women are not recognized as people who can lead, and it has to be said. But you still go to church. <laughs> well, I, okay. I'm an Episcopalian. I can't say I go to church very often. <laughs> but what, 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 what must be said is that, that, that much of the sexism in society begins with religion. People learn first what faith they are and they carry those traditions into the rest of society. So the church or the synagogue or whatever its institution has to begin to take responsibility. Go ahead. I would just say, the only thing I would add, because I fully agree with everything you said, is religious illiteracy. Because we're not really understanding the depths of religion, it's been manipulated against our gender. Does that, does, is that true? For, you're, you're from Louisiana, but you're not Catholic, right? No, I'm Presbyterian. Oh, okay. But, uh, but I was very active in the church growing up. But my grandmother and her friends, who ran the church, who did everything. Yeah. Ran the bake sales. My yeah. all, dad yeah. and granddad were elders, but my grandmother wasn't eligible to right. be an elder. And that yeah. finally changed. Sure. So there, some, of, some religions are are moving, right. others seem really stuck. And I wonder if it'll sort of fall by the wayside. I think about, you know, um, interfaith couples are being more welcomed in certain religions now. Um, there's sort of a sense that things are changing and is it, you know, just we have to be a little bit patient that so reform synagogues are allowing women, how much longer will conservative ones be able to hold out? I'm just beginning to think that some of this will happen naturally and that these conversations are still very important. I really don't think it'll happen naturally. Mm. People who are denied their rights don't get them unless they speak up. Right. So the one good thing about this assembly that I see is that women are speaking for themselves. Nobody gives you anything. Mm -hmm. If there's something wrong in, in your religion and you don't speak up, sure. it's going to continue to be wrong. But, you know, w women are, as we have discussed, the backbone of the church. They run the bake sales. They make sure the family tithes. They take the kids to church. Um, they frequently get their husbands to go with them when the husbands <laughs> might not otherwise do that. But the fact is, at least in the United States and in Europe, educated women are not going to church anymore. And that's actually what's causing all the empty churches, all the empty Catholic churches in the United States, in Europe. So it's, it's people who are less educated who are the most fiercely religious right now. So is it not up to women to educate all women, not just about how to become a lawyer or a doctor, but also about what the text in the religion actually says? Because you, were, you and I were at an event mm -hmm. at your place of work this week where we talked about that the, the Quran is often misinterpreted because it's been it, because of cultural influences mm -hmm. where men take charge as opposed to women really understanding their rights. Absolutely. I think, you know, religious knowledge is the key. You have to um, argue from within the religious framework. And I completely agree. I mean, men aren't going to give us power and they're using it. They're saying, oh, if you're objecting, you're not objecting to me, you're objecting to God, which has silenced women for too long. And I think people are coming out with knowledge of religion and saying, that's you, that's not God, that's not religion. And here's how we can empower ourselves. Yeah, no, and I suppose there's certain religions where sort of debate, and maybe I'm thinking of my own, is constant, and so these conversations happen all the time, and certainly I've, you know, it's funny, you can be within the same faith and still feel as though you're very, things are very foreign, and I've been with Orthodox Jews who have very different traditions and, and much more gender separated than, than I was raised by, you know, so there's definitely a conversation to be had, and I think it will be an interesting one. Your thoughts on moving forward, also on on your big topic right now, which is domestic violence. How does, how could the church help end that? Yeah, that you know, the church could make an extra. All of the church, all religions everywhere, could make an extraordinary amount of difference on social ills that plague not only our own country but around the world if they would speak out. And I think this is something that we're seeing with uh, Pope Francis, who's speaking mm -hmm. out about. Mm -hmm. Uh, mistreatment of people and inequality. And he but and is I don't he speaking see out on domestic? On everything, but he's talking about things that are important. Okay, him. but what about domestic violence? Should he yeah. be? He's he, by, and he, he already should. has the one area of progression in the church that he slammed the door on early in his papacy was women as priests. Yeah. 
So yeah, it, and and more reproductive freedom for hmm. women also has been foreclosed. But you know, there are plenty of other people who could talk about that. If religious leaders around the world would each talk about the areas that would impact people's lives, it would impact women's lives, it would make an extraordinary difference. It doesn't have to all be on Pope Francis. Yeah, this, the, the Pope's uh, progressive notions of trying to move his church into the 21st century just stopped cold when the notion of leadership was raised. And look at why, well, what the reason he gives because Jesus had 12 male disciples. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't he talk about all the women who were around mm -hmm. Jesus? There were a, a plethora of women mm -hmm. who were around Jesus. Catholics worship the Virgin Mary. Doesn't she count? Uh, so it seems to me that there are many women who could, who could make, m many women in the background of the Christian faith that could make the case for equality of women in certainly all Christian religions. All right. Let us know what you think. Please follow me on Twitter, at Bonnie Urbe or at To The Contrary. From religion to the pay gap. Academy Award winner Jennifer Lawrence is the latest actress calling out Hollywood for pay inequity. Lawrence went public this week about being paid less than her male co-stars in American Hustle. In an online essay, she writes, quote, I am over trying to find the adorable way to state my opinion and still be likable, end quote. The infamous hack of Sony computers revealed to Lawrence that Bradley Cooper, Jeremy Renner, and Christian Bale all negotiated significantly better deals for their roles. Lawrence doesn't blame the men or even Sony. She blames herself for giving up early because she didn't want to keep fighting over millions of dollars she didn't need, and she didn't want to appear difficult. But those days, she says, are over. Meryl Streep also talked about the issue, as she has many times, in a BBC interview, that during her rollout of her latest movie, The Suffragette. So, Sabrina Schaefer, I, I, for myself, on some level, you know, a woman who made $52 million last year, it's not, <laughs> right. you know, not it's, it, sleepover. it's easy to dismiss it and say, it doesn't affect me. Right. But I really think it does affect me. Right. Isn't there, there is a trickle down. No, you're right. You're right. No, actually, I think that this is very interesting because it shows how the conversation over pay equity is evolving. Just last night in an event that we were at, I, I, we were talking about sort of incremental changes. And I think this conversation has evolved a lot where people are kind of coming to a middle ground. They're saying, okay, the pay gap might not be as bad as we thought it was, but women need to maybe do a little bit more. But at the same time, you know, there's some problems there. And I think that this is sort of a good opportunity for us to say, you know, sometimes you, you can do more. Sometimes you're going to ask and you're not going to get it. Sometimes there's there's real discrimination. And so having sort of a more honest conversation, which I think she allows us to have, is, a, is a very important. But qu a quick question. Does anybody think she was really in on the negotiations? This was her agent. Asking. Yeah, I think that's the this problem. This was the guy's right? agent. Mm -hmm. I mean, the agent may have said, look, I've gotten all I can get. And maybe Brad Cooper said, get back in there and get more. And she said, OK, enough already. I mean, I, I could certainly have a roof over my head for that amount of money. But I also think the agent's job is to advise her. I mean, I love everything she said up until the point where she thought that it was partially her fault. Because I think oh, yeah. that there is a society and there are agents or there are people in power. I mean, I've been in I mean, nothing near that. But where you negotiate and you really see that everyone around the table is giving you the same message. This is as good as it gets. You're breaking a ceiling for other women. So trying to compare you to other women versus really looking at it without a gender lens in, in terms of equality. And so I think that that is a challenge. I have a, you know, so much love for people in media who take up important issues, and I'm really glad to see her do this. I'm, I'm glad to see her do it precisely because she earned $52 million. Mm -hmm. yeah. When the average woman sees that even at that level, women get, forgive me, screwed, mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 they will wake up and say, my goodness, I wonder what must, must be happening to me. And the reason she gives shows that no matter how high you get, you're giving the same reasons for not speaking up. But why you got some power. Why yeah. is it? Yeah. Why, exactly. I mean, she, <laughs> you have to be willing to walk away from deals yeah. that aren't equal. And she, you know, when you're, when you're a janitor for a living, you can't do that. You've got to take whatever employment you can find. When you're a secretary, when you're a, you know, a, a, a retail clerk, mm -hmm. you have to take what you can find. But why can't women in power's agents say she wants every bit as much as much as Brad Bradley Cooper is making plus a million bucks or she's walking away from this well, deal. I'll tell you the first thing she should, should do is she should get a female agent 
because the research... Does she have a, Do the, we know she has a male well, agent? The, we know that the research on negotiation and women is that women are better negotiators than men when they're negotiating for someone else. Mm -hmm. When they're negotiating on behalf of a colleague or a subordinate for somebody else to get something, women do better than men do. Mm -hmm. They do not do as well as men when they are negotiating for themselves, not because they aren't asking for enough, but because they are punished for negotiating. Mm -hmm. Professor mm -hmm. Bowles at Harvard found that women who push are seen negatively by their colleagues right. and that their coworkers say they don't want to work with those women and who are absolutely. too pushy. I would be but, women, but should women just say, look, whatever I do, you're going to see me as pushy and I don't care because I'm pushing just as hard as the men. Yes, well, do. certainly, but I also am kind of curious of what's going on on the other side. For instance, we don't really know who was on the other side of the negotiating table. I think very often we assume it's the men who are saying no. We don't know that there wasn't a woman at that table saying no who's no, thinking I, I know. from her perspective, <laughs> from her perspective <laughs> that Bradley Cooper is more appealing to women and therefore maybe women are more, they buy more movie tickets than men do, therefore we're going to pay him more. I mean, I think that there's sort of some interesting nuances here, and that's not to defend you know, what happened here. I'm just sort of thinking about it. I think the perception sometimes is that men are these bad bosses and there's a lot of women making these decisions. Yeah, and I think that's where it's irrelevant. So whoever's at the other side of the table, woman or man, <laughs> right. is irrelevant. The idea right. is that she didn't get a fair deal. And, and you know, a, a lot of times I see management where there's a woman president and so the expectation right. was that's enough. You have a woman president it's at the very top. Why are you complaining? Right. And, and it's again, it's irrelevant who's doing the discrimination, well, you know, a woman or a man. One thing that um, Meryl Streep said uh, in that interview we referred to was that the, t the top 10 sellers of movies, uh, the, the, it, the country's divided up into uh, ter 10 territories. They're all men. They're all selling, Wrong. they're all telling what, what, you know, each cinema in your local area has to carry what, what they're going to sell you. Mm -hmm. And so doesn't that have an influence too? I would have thought so. So I, I take back my, my previous <laughs> statement. I mean, look, I, I think that there discrimination exists. I just think it's important to sort of see, and I think that this is the value that she brings. There's two sides to this issue. One is that I think there's instances where women can do more for themselves, where we don't always take the initiative. And at the same time, we have to recognize when there really is true discrimination. I don't know exactly what happened behind the scenes here, but I think that she elevates the conversation. Well, you know, as with religions that we just finished uh -huh. discussing, who do you think goes to the movies? Turns out that they're women. Yeah, of course. Uh, we can't have an impact no matter we what we do. We use the internet <laughs> more. We go to pl we buy more theater tickets. There was a the I'm not a theater fan, but there was and still is, I believe, a big theater women's theater festival in D.C. Yeah. And yes. I kept saying to myself, I got to go buy a ticket, even if I don't go to the play. I've got to support this and. Um, I didn't, you know, I'll be honest and say I'm leaving for a long trip and I didn't do it and I feel very guilty about <laughs> it. Behind the headlines, over parenting, whether it's in K-12 through college or even early adulthood, some parents are doing too much for their kids. One teacher has written a book on why kids need to learn how to try, succeed and even fail on their own. Jessica Leahy is a teacher, an author, and a mother. Since she started teaching almost 17 years ago, she began noticing a trend among her students. They were becoming more fearful. They were becoming more uh, scared of making mistakes, more scared of looking silly. This fear of failure, she reasoned, was propelled by parents. That made her re-examine her own parenting. I had a child just going into middle school at the time, and if those parents were complicit, then I was complicit myself. So. I dove into the research to figure out what I was doing wrong as a parent so I could help my students' parents um, get at a better way to be, a better way to focus on the, the process of learning rather than the end product of grades or honors or whatever that thing is. The problem? Leahy says it's over-parenting. Over-parenting is when you don't allow your child to take their first whack at a problem. When you jump in and rescue them immediately before allowing them to see if they can do it themselves and to have that opportunity to screw up and, and pick themselves up and do it again. Um, and what that leads to are kids who are less likely to be able to do um, their own tasks in your absence. So when parents aren't there, suddenly these kids just don't know what to do. A recent Brigham Young University study found that so-called helicopter parenting led to kids with lower self-worth. We've really taught kids to worship 
these false idols of grades, of uh, test scores, of admissions to you know high octane universities. And those things are great. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be encouraging kids to do well in school. That's absolutely not my message. My message is that those kind of extrinsic motivators, motivators that come from outside, are really, really screwing up kids' motivation to learn. One thing that we know from the research on human motivation um, is that when you Im impose extrinsic motivators to kids' learning, uh, they are a lot less likely to be invested in the learning itself. We are a country that values the product of kids' learning, the test score, the grade, the honors, as opposed to the process of the learning itself. So what can parents do? When your kid comes home on the day they've had a big test, don't say, what'd you get on the test? Say, how did it go? What did you do to learn? What did you do this time around that went well? And what might you repeat next time? Or what didn't go well? Why do you think that you got these all of these questions of this type wrong? What, was, what did you try to do to study this time? And, and what might you not do next time to avoid this problem again? According to Leahy, parents need to fear failure less if they want their kids to become more self-confident. We've been criticized as creating a generation of good test takers, uh, kids who can't think in any creative fashion, can't be innovators. And the gift of failure is that when you do fail, you have to react in a positive way to that failure and you learn how to be more creative. You learn how to innovate. You learn how to be resourceful, pick up the right pieces, bring those with you and leave the pieces that didn't work behind. So are too many parents over parenting today? Well, it certainly sounds like that, but let me tell you what a relief it is to hear this because there were times I worried that I wasn't pushing my kids hard enough, but now they are super independent. Wonderful. And how'd you do that? Hands off. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I don't get it. If more people are over parenting, then why is this, why is this their constant, a, a constant cry from working mothers, working fathers, about not having enough time. How can you possibly yeah. have a job and overparent at the same time? Right, and I've often wondered if this is a bit sort of um, differentiated along the sort of socioeconomic scale. Certainly, I find in a city like Washington, um, you have a lot of moms, many certain segments who don't have to work, and so they are able to sort of throw themselves into parenting in a way that's both wonderful and also um, perhaps smothering. And I think all of us have to sort of step back at times and say, you know, does my kid really need me to stand under the tree, or can they? figure it out. Are they going to go to the hospital or are they going to get a Band-Aid? And I think that's an important sort of decision yeah. to make. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it really looks like these parents are acting out their own ambitions yes. on their children <laughs> right. and, and creating great suffering right. and depression. As a result, just, just think about a child who's learning to do something. The moment a parent tries to help them, they say, let me do it, mommy, let me do it, mommy. What, what is that? Mm -hmm. A child yearns to be creative. I don't know whether it's the violence in the society. Uh, you know, they're, they're afraid if a child is alone for a few minutes, something will happen to them. Is it the competitiveness? Our, our How society? about technology? I mean, I'm just thinking, you're in Congress, you have two children. There are plenty of other women in Congress who have children. Uh, can you use texting as a, you know, as a way to do too much for your child? Well, so can some, some, some a, a molester, mm -hmm. and that may be what what they are afraid of, and and we we become we closet our children, and, and therefore we're going to have a less creative. Um, uh, gender uh, or less creative generation for the first time if we don't back off. So I mean it's interesting so I'm the only person who's I think that's not a parent and I'm I, child free uh, and choice. I'm coming out like full defense <laughs> of the parents because I don't think the title bothers me I don't think there's anything called over parenting I don't think you could ever do enough for your child I think it's the tools and the techniques and a lot of the, what we're talking about it needs to be differentiated um, I also think that a lot of what she's criticizing is the education system and what we I mean it's not in parents um, hands and if we can switch more to the Montessori the Waldorf style then that's a p potential solution but it has to happen within the public schools as well as the private because it's not accessible. What You have three kids yeah. and you have an incredibly demanding job. Well. Do you ever feel like you overparent? Yeah, yes, I do. And I also wonder if some of this has to do with sort of changing gender roles, right? There was a time when you didn't have to balance that work part of it and my kids are real lives now and real places to be and I want to be involved and make sure someone's reading enough and someone's doing their math homework. And so um, I sort of wonder as some of this is imposed on us, some of it is sort of sorting out the details of two parents' 
working um, out of necessity or out of choice. Um, and it, it will be perhaps take a generation to look back and say, hey, you know, where could we have been a little bit better and how can we improve on this? All right. That's it for this edition. Please follow me on Twitter and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week. Well, that's all. Oh, God. God. <laughs>